because it's a nice evening here in Galway and get out and enjoy some sunshine still. So anyway, on the panel, I'm joined by, by Senator Pauline O'Reilly, and uh, Senator O'Reilly is a chairperson of the, the Green Party. Uh, she was elected to the, the Shannon on the Labour panel in April 2020, uh, and she was also elected to the Galway City Council in the 2019 local elections. Uh, she's a spokesperson in the Green Party for education and higher education, and she served as leader in the uh, leader of the Green Party in the Shannon uh, until December 2022. On my left here, we have uh, Dr. James Moran, and James is a senior lecturer in ecology and biology at the newly named Atlantic Technological University, uh, which I saw as I drove into to Galway this, this afternoon. Uh, so he's got a lot of experience in the field of EU issues and in particular with the, uh, the so-called LIFE project. So LIFE is a, a project that we run, uh, or Environmental Director General runs, uh, to look at various different aspects of what we can do with the environment. Uh, and James worked on one of the very early ones, very early Irish ones, which was the Burn LIFE project, uh, which is seen as a sort of forerunner of, of a, a way to run a, a good project. And then at the end of the table, I have Henry Walsh, and Henry is the uh, environmental representative for the uh, for the Galway Irish Farmers Association. Uh, so you're a full-time farmer yes. in in, in Arran Moor, uh, which your wife Patricia and son's uh, son Enda, who has just returned from finalising his agricultural degree in uh, in, in UCD. Uh, so I think we're lucky in that Henry says that he's objective is to produce high quality food while implementing best best farming practices so we have sort of a, a wide variety of, of experience here at the table tonight and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak for about five to seven minutes uh, and we we'll listen to them all in turn and then we will throw the floor open to questions so I hope that's okay so we start with uh, Senator Pauline. Pauline the floor is yours. Thank you so much well it's a it's a delight to be here in my own city in Galway and to talk about this really, really important uh, strategy, which is farm to fork. But look, I think what's, what's really clear is that <clears throat> if, we, if we don't protect nature, nature is not going to be there for us. And that's the bottom line. Uh, our food systems require a healthy environment because if you think about it, uh, from pollination to water quality to air quality, uh, all of these things are actually what go into producing healthy food. So, you know, when we look at the, at the, the start of this mandate in the EU uh, Commission, the, the new Green Deal was there to basically look at the fact that we, we are really running into trouble if we don't protect nature. We're really running into trouble if we don't reverse climate damage. And this farm to fork strategy, along with the nature restoration law, they're the two big packages on the nature side of things. And at the moment, uh, they're hotly uh, contested some elements of that. And I think it's really important to talk about that because um, I believe that there's a short termism when it comes to politics generally. And I also believe that sometimes people think that they're not being observed when they're off there over in Europe and that's why it's really important for the public to get involved and actually one of the key parts of the farm to fork strategy uh, which you pointed out there is is about the inputs into food production pesticides fertilizers and these are core parts of, of farm to fork that we need to drastically reduce both uh, fertilizers and pesticides and in fact consumers say that that's what they want so uh, the European um, citizens initiative uh, had over 1 million people sign up and say that they wanted to have um, a change to the way that that pesticides are regulated and one of the big things of course is that in the past and, and currently because we have no signed deal um, the, the use of pesticides was a directive where what is envisaged by the farm to fork strategy is that it's a regulation so much tougher um, and it means that it's, it's not relying on individual countries to implement it so I mean we can go into the details and I'm looking forward to going into the details but ultimately my two big key messages are we haven't delivered on this nature package uh, yes, we have delivered on some of the parts on climate, 
but there have to be questions asked as to why the EU is continuing to delay in the Parliament, in the, in the Council in particular, they're continuing to delay some of the legislation, particularly around pesticides. And I do think that it's big lobby groups who are having too much of a say. And when we've actually seen that the citizens, the consumers themselves, want this implemented, serious questions have to be asked of our politicians, of our MEPs. We know that when it, came to, when it comes to nature restoration law, which is a different, a different strategy, but actually both are, are, you know, work in tandem, we had several of our Irish MEPs vote against um, nature restoration law uh, a couple of weeks ago. There'll be another vote next week, and there'll be one the following weeks. We, we'll, have to, we'll have to observe that. Um, but that, that runs across Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin. So it's a matter of huge concern to us that in this mandate, in this lifetime of, of um, the European Parliament, that we may not see the kind of progress that we, that we need to see. So um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is um, how important it is that we focus not just on climate. We talk about climate all the time, but actually nature. Uh, you know, 80% of our habitats are in severe decline. 1,677 species across Europe are facing extinction. This is urgent now. And unless we reverse that, we won't have any food security. We won't have the kind of quality of life that we had when we were children. Uh, you only have to look around you to see that there are fewer birds, there are fewer insects. Insects are important for our, for our food, but you know they're also important for their own sake. Um, that we have an obligation, we have to be responsible citizens and care for those that are depending on us and depending on our political system, even though they can't vote, and that's nature. So that's my opening uh, gambit, um, uh, but I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, it, it's interesting, I guess, for the audience to hear a politician giving out about other politicians. Maybe not quite unexpected, but uh, it's interesting. Well, it was good reason in this case. <laughs> we'll come back to that uh, during the discussion, perhaps. Uh, then I would like to turn to James. James, you have seven minutes starting now. All right, grand. Um, I, have, uh, I just want to set some context and maybe put a couple of figures out there and maybe it's defined some of the stuff we're talking about as well. But... Uh, one of the first things I'd want to talk about is I'm absolutely dismayed about the polarisation and debate between agriculture, nature uh, and, and the environment. Gro growing up on a farm, living in a, a rural area, working in uh, Galway City here, when you talk to people on the ground, work in rural communities, talk to people in an urban setting, that polarisation that you see on, on social media and in the debate in the media in general uh, doesn't come across. Everyone wants to, to live in a, a better environment, a better society, maybe where we uh, cross swords at is what constitutes better and maybe accepting some of the facts of the state that we're in at the moment. There's a, a slight bit of a, an ostrich mentality sticking our heads in the sand when we're trying to face some of the major challenges and hoping they'll go away and thinking we're, we're all right, Jack, so everyone else can go to hell, sort of. And there is some parts of the world that are suffering uh, serious problems at the moment and I think uh, a wake up call might be the, the smoke we see from the fires in Canada in New York at the moment when it hits a very developed society one of the richest cities in the world that's going to be hit directly by the consequences of basically mismanagement of our, our natural environment. That's now something that I hadn't written down, a bit of a rant at the start hopefully I won't rant too much but uh, so first thing I, I really want to say when I stick to my script is I want to in, in terms of sustainable agriculture and land use, I think it's important to mention what we mean by sustainability. And when I refer to it, I think of it as a, in a holistic manner, encompassing the three aspects of it, the economy, society, and the, and the environment. And it should be imbued in the context of meeting the 17 sustainable development goals that, that countries of the world have agreed at United Nations level. And it should be clear from the 17 sustainable development goals that the economy, including responsible consumption and production, is a tool of a functioning society and should serve the needs of that society, contributing to health and well-being, equality, education and zero hunger. And the foundation of both our economy and the society is dependent on a healthy biosphere. I mean the atmosphere, the land, uh, the water that we're all dependent on. And I think a key thing, going back to my, my first point, is the central access to achieving actual sustainable development goals is partnership. 
and collaboration, sharing knowledge, the power of the human society as a whole to find solutions to some of the most pressing issues that we've dealt with over, over thousands of years. Polarisation leads to wars and conflict. Eventually we come out of them and have to find solutions eventually. So there is significant demand on our land base to contribute to enhanced climate action, nature restoration, while also maintaining viable food and fibre production. And to respond to these needs of society, we need to take a more integrated uh, approach to our, our land use cognizant of the need to adapt a more adaptive management approach, essentially learning while doing. We don't have time to research everything, to find out all the answers. We know what we know now. We put the best plans in place possible. We implement them, monitor them as we go along. If they're not working, we change them rapidly and move on. And in the context in terms of what we're facing, in terms of uh, rapid climate change, the changing weather patterns that we're seeing, it's important and it's essential that the large scale changes to our land use that are required over the next 30 years are, are managed. And there must be clear direction and leadership from our government, and there must be whole of government and whole of society supports for what needs to be done uh, in, our, in our land base. So that will require substantial institutional and innovation and capacity building from EU level all the way down to local community level. We cannot keep doing what we're doing now and expect to get a, a different answer. And one thing that gives me great hope is that I've seen local communities and individuals across the country take the lead. And we have to create an enabling environment where local action is fostered, takes place within and contributes to larger national, regional and agreed goals for a transformation of our, our society and our land base. And we need to have a clear land use strategy with short term goals on the five year, medium, which I'm talking about 30 years and long term intergenerational vision for where we need to get to within the, within the next 100 years. But the scale of the challenge uh, cannot be underestimated in terms of sustainable land use. And just to give you a few facts in terms of where we are, we're not in a good place at the moment, okay? Human activities are driving both climate change and biodiversity loss, which are the biggest threats to our food security and biggest threats to our uh, e economy, as all the economists are starting to realise uh, now. They're among the top threats uh, that the World Economic Forum are identifying in terms of our threats to society and the economy. In terms of at home here, in terms of biodiversity, 85% of our protected habitats are in unfavourable condition. And what's worse, 46% of this are illustrating a declining trend. Overwintering, wintering birds have declined by 40%. Now, what's 40%? 500,000 individuals that were coming to Ireland in the 1990s are no longer coming to Ireland uh, to, to winter any, anymore. Semi-natural grasslands in a country that prides itself on our 40 shades of green, we're losing a lot of them shades of green. 30% of the area monitored has been lost in the last 10 to 15 years. It's uh, astonishing. In terms of climate change, the projections for Ireland by mid-century are indicate an increase in annual temperatures of 1 to 1.2. We're already at 1.1 degrees. This will lead to a decrease in summer participation. The drought we've seen in 2018, it looks like it's repeating itself this year and will be a more regular event, including heat waves, especially affecting the south and, and east of the country, as well as increases in frequency of heavy precipitation events. And heavy precipitation events in the west of Ireland, on top of the rainfall that we're already getting, basically our arterial drainage systems won't be able to cope with that. So it sees a whole scale change to that. We're going to get maybe increased uh, uh, growth uh, in terms of the growing season but the problem will be because of these drought conditions and also the heavy rain we're not going to be able to utilize uh, that, that growth because of the traffickability of the land as well so it may change in that. We're already uh, we're hoping to limit global warming to 1.5. The scientists come out in the IPCC report the summary for policy makers in, the, in this year and that is unachievable. We're sailing past 1.5 we'll reach it in the next uh, decade and we're careering towards two degrees. All we can hope for at this stage is that the, once we hit the 1.5 and tipping points start hitting in, that society starts waking up. Hopefully New York will wake up uh, this week a bit, but the rest of the world has to, has to wake up as well. That will mean, the one thing I worry about in that, when society wakes up rapidly from the slumber that it's in at the moment, you get knee-jerk reaction, which leads to bad policy, poor uh, decision-making. We're going to have to, we're, we're, we're at this stage now, we have to mitigate the worst of it, but we have, we're in this stage now where we have to adapt. So our current systems that we're working, our current food systems will not survive in a 1.5 degrees world that we'll be hitting in the next decade. So no matter what we say, resistance to change is futile because we're going to be forced into that and it was, we might as well manage uh, that change. 
all things, when we're coming up with solutions, we must also acknowledge that Ireland is a diverse mix of landscapes. It's characterised by differences in geology, topography, soils, climatic variation and land cover, and the wide range of, of land use capacities. And when we're seeking solutions, we must realise that one size does not fit all, and we'll have to look at different land types that are naturally advantaged for producing food and fibre, naturally advantaged for carbon storage, naturally advantaged for food, food uh, a flood alleviation, space for nature, amenity and recreational value, and match the land use we're incentivizing and, and enabling to the capacity of that land. So we must enable improved interactions between our environment and food production systems on a farm by farm, parish by parish, region by region basis, and local action within the, the broader uh, society must occur within what I'm talking about, this enabling societal uh, framework. So. At the moment, many local uh, initiatives involving rural communities as well as individual farmers have successfully trialled and tested solutions. Thinking about the burn programme that I worked in with, with Brendan and Sharon over many years, we've, been, we've tested pr approaches, similar approaches in European innovation partnerships uh, across the country as well, and we're working on life integrated projects to test these models to bring them to uh, fruition as well. So it's not as if we don't know enough at the moment. One thing that I'm absolutely amazed at is the way the politicians are treating the nature restoration law as a political football at the moment. And one party in particular has run off of the football and tried to punch it. You know, not playing fair under any circumstances. That nature restoration law, whether we have a law or not, nature needs restoring for our existence of humanity. And this is key, whether we have a law to do it, whether we don't have a law to do it. But this wrangling that's going on at the moment and the misinformation that's out there around this debate. Sometimes I wonder, did any of the politicians actually read what was proposed in the law? Most of the targets that are in that are set by our own government in the food vision, in our climate action plan. So it's, I can't understand how, uh, I'm not gonna go into, uh, I could say more now, I'm going off point, but back to, back to my point. It's not just about production as well, it's about consumption. And I think in terms of consumption, everyone here in the room, we all consume food, so we all have a responsibility on this. This is not on 135,000 farmers in the country. This is on four to five million consumers in Ireland, and also the 65 million consumers that consume our food uh, across the globe. In terms of what's sustainable consumption, the Food and Agriculture Organization defined this back in 2010. Sustainable diets are those diets with low environmental impacts which contribute to food and nutrition security and to healthy life for the present and future generations. And sustainable diets are protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair and affordable, nutritionally adequate, safe and healthy, while optimizing natural and human resources. Again, there's not one diet for, for one culture, there's different diets in different contexts, and together, if we can supply them diets without destroying the planet on which we live in, then we have sustainable, sustainable diets. It's quite a, a complex definition, but going back to my point, the simplification of the debate that's around at the moment, the polarization in the debate, is not helpful for the solutions we have to find so such a complex issue in terms of our, the food system we depend on and our interactions with nature and the environment as a whole. I might have gone over my seven minutes. Uh, just, just, <laughs> just, just a little bit, James. Yeah. And, and, and thanks so much for adding more football analogies to the nature restoration <laughs> law, which we, we may come back to in the course of, of, of the discussion. But right now, I just want to move on to Henry and get, get your views uh, as, as a, a working farmer, particularly on this whole branch of fork and sustainability issue. Thanks, Tim. So good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening I want to discuss agriculture under four broad headings, air quality, water quality, biodiversity and farm viability. For the last four years, in our experience, all of the debate involving agriculture has been negative, particularly around the climate issues, with no recognition of us as a, a high quality food producers. Very few people, in my opinion, that I speak to, want to listen to the farmer's viewpoint at present, <coughs> unless we're in agreement with a cull of the national herd, uh, unless we're willing to plant forestry on our private farmland, or unless we're re willing or sorry, willing to re wet our farmlands. And there is no debate at the moment in terms of uh, compensation or how farmers will be treated throughout all of this. The EU Green Deal, Farm to Fork, the Nitrates Directive, and the Climate Action Plan have set huge targets for farmers to comply with. I'm here to talk about how farmers are embracing these directives but I'm also here as a vice for agriculture because I've come to the realization at this stage, if we don't defend ourselves, nobody else will. Our agri-researchers in Moorpark 
have developed a roadmap with 17 actions known as the MAC curve to reduce emissions in agriculture. And the most important factor, in my opinion, in all of these is communication. Communication with farmers and um, um, helping to get farmers to, uh, to buy into it. We have lots of different actions that I can just mention. Some of them are things like low emission slurry spreading of, um, uh, spreading of lime, the use of protected urea and the use of genetics in our cows. A real challenge within all of this that we have to overcome is that the average age profile in agriculture is 59 years old. The number of part-time farmers and finally the lack of profitability on so many farms. So I think James' point is very, very well made there. It's crucial uh, that farmers, that we get buy-in, that they're supported and that the actions we take um, you know, do not lead to our businesses effectively terminating and becoming unviable. Uh, two points were touched on there already actually now. Two examples the EU want us to reduce pesticide usage by 50% by 2030. Very desirable target. The amazing thing about it when we actually quantify that, at the moment Ireland uses 50 less than 50% of the average EU pesticide, which means we've already hit the target in Ireland if you're to look at it in a general basis. The second thing, and in turn James also touched on it, is that agriculture only uses 50% of the pesticide in Ireland. Domestic, industrial, all of the other activities in this country use the other half of our pesticides, you know, whether it be for green fly, uh, moss on the lawn, moss on the, the, the um, washing powder in the thermic atom, all of these things. So agriculture maybe is taking an unfair burden. Pauline referenced very, very well the need to reduce fertilizer usage. We've been set a target, both within our own climate action plan and uh, the EU, the Green Deal, to reduce our fertilizer by 20 percent, sorry, by 20 percent by 2030. We almost achieved that last year. Again, zero recognition of that. Fertilizer usage was down by over 20 percent in Ireland last year. Uh, it's critical that we reduce these emissions uh, for both air quality, but equally as important is water quality. The EU Green Deal focused on biodiversity loss, which is absolutely crucial that we reverse this in terms of food production systems and the survival of humanity. Because humanity are currently consuming everything in their path. The Green Deal completely disregard, disregarded any concerns raised by farmers around food security or the viability of its farms in its designing of the Green Deal. Similarly, EU legislators failed their citizens, in my opinion, on energy security. They did deals with powerful dictators rewarding them financially for the extraction of fossil fuels, uh, for example, oil, gas and coal, which are the real cause of global warming, not animals. The GWP matrix, uh, 100 matrix, is designed to measure carbon emissions from fossil fuels and is fundamentally flawed at measuring the interic emissions that come from livestock, where the GWP star is now an internationally recognised mechanism, much more accurate, but will not be considered until the year 2030 in terms of its use. The, inv the invasion of Ukraine unleashed rampant inflation on every one of us as consumers. And we're all consumers. I might be here as a farmer, but I'm most definitely a consumer also. But somehow food price inflation was conveniently associated with increased farm price gains. Nothing to do with uh, diesel prices, oil prices, all of the other costs in the system. Farmers were accused of increasing their prices and that that was the cause of supermarkets increasing their... So we feel de very defensive in all of that. In a recent interview, the EU Agricultural Com Commissioner Yanis Wojcicki stated that since the invasion, food security has climbed right back up the EU Parliament's priority list. It took the war for us to realise food security is crucial in Europe. Empty shelves obviously carry a lot more weight than any written reports. Interestingly, in the same interview, Mr. Wojcicki described Irish agriculture as a good example of extensive grass-based farming with high welfare standards. Recent measurements have calculated that on average 12 to 14 percent of your average Irish farm is made up of space for nature. I believe global population growth and consumption, consumption are two critical areas that we must factor into every discussion. In 1960, the world population was about 3 billion people, and that was the first time fertilizer and pesticides started to be used and became freely available. 
In the intervening 60 years, the population has increased to 8 billion and continues to grow by over 80 million people per annum. In the same food pe period, food production quadrupled, resulting in abundant, cheap food that's taken for granted by governments and consumers, most of whom spend less than 10% of their annual income on food. Everybody thinks it's a lot more. Food consumption and the shopping trolley are not the same thing. There's lots of other um, items in the shopping trolley and sometimes we, we mix up the two. It's predicted global food production will fall with the reduction of fertiliser and pesticides. The choice and affordability of food available to Irish consumers now bears no resemblance to what my parents had and in all of this debate I wonder um, if, they are, if Irish consumers, and Pauline referenced them very well, the million people within the 700 million people in Europe that tick the box that they want, biodiversity looked after, which is all fantastic, but I wonder are they willing to pay a premium for local food or organic food? And perhaps even more importantly, will somebody influence the major retailers who control over 90% of our sales to accommodate either local or uh, organic food on their centralised distribution network? I can hold my hand up now and say they won't. Agriculture is the only sector that can sequester carbon in its soils, its woodlands, its peatlands. However, the model that this is built around must be developed in collaboration with farmers, be scientifically based, with trust at its core, reward farmers for their work, and above all, must not sterilise farms with designations and, in effect, in our opinion, amount to a land grab. Another very serious point is the ambitious target set uh, the rewetting that James referenced for forestry, renewable energy uh, and um, um, uh, anaerobic digesters. These targets have been set without any consideration for the socio-economic um, situation within rural communities. This is, a quite, this is quite incredible considering the amount of people we are told go to bed hungry in Ireland every year and considering population. The challenge for agriculture is to embrace the aspirations of the farm to fork and the Green Deal and still achieve a viable income for themselves, their families and face down retail power uh, which is effectively forcing poor profitability on pretty much three quarters of farms in this country. In summary, contrary to what most media commentators would have you believe, Irish farmers are the ones producing safe, affordable food. Farmers are working to a scientific roadmap to reduce our footprint and farmers will not be able to deliver change unless their farms remain viable. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks so much Henry. Lots of uh, food for thought in, in, in that presentation, if you don't mind me using it, uh, that, that expression. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to throw the floor open to, to questions. Uh, but before we do that, I've just got one quick question for, for each of, of the panellists. Uh, and in particular, uh, I'm going to start with, with Pauline, then move on to, to James and then Henry. Uh, so Pauline, in the context of the EU, obviously the European Green Deal is hugely, hugely important for us. Uh, and the idea that Europe would become climate neutral by, by 2050 is sort of a leap motif that we have. And we just want to ensure that this happens in a number of, of different ways. Uh, and the Green Deal is, is just one of these, and the Farm to Fork uh, policy is one of these. But my question for you, because your experience is mainly within the Irish uh, uh, political context. Do you think that politicians in Ireland are really taking climate change as seriously as it should be? No, and, I, and I, I think, you know, I think one of the difficulties is, and obviously I'm coming in after, I've heard both of the other speakers, so um, I, I just want to address some of that because um, there is, seems to be a narrative there that somehow environmentalists, the Green Party, are, you know, attacking farmers when nothing could be further from the truth and you know in saying that it isn't about polarization it's actually we just have to get some facts out there otherwise we stay quiet in the corner and nature can't wait you know so 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 absolutely will never ever hear any of us criticize farmers farmers are the custodians of the land it's got to work for farmers but at the heart of nature restoration law is Ireland putting into place its own policy, which will have full consultation. So we do hear this narrative that people aren't being consulted with, when actually the basis of these pieces of policy are consultation over the next couple of years. And I, I, I don't agree that it's too ambitious for Ireland. And in fact, the rewetting targets that 
uh, are being discussed now under the nature restoration law, we'll hit that within the next year or two in Ireland for, for 2030 because we've actually come a long way and, and the vast majority of it is on public land. But I think that um, James is correct. It, it's, really, it's really difficult to stomach some of the conversation that's going on in politics at the moment as if we haven't done anything, as if we haven't signed up to anything. We've already signed up to most of this stuff locally. We had cross-party support for the Climate Act. We have most things already laid down in the programme for government. So you have to ask the question, why are politicians stoking this fear in rural Ireland? And I'll tell you why. It's boats, pure and simple. And so people have to ask real questions. And, you know, I agree with a lot of what um, Henry has said, but, you know, I heard the word cull in there. Like, we have pointed out numerous times, the IFA know this, everybody knows this who is involved. Um, nobody has mentioned culling in Ireland. It, it's, it's not happening. There's no policy around culling. So why do we keep hearing people mentioning it over and over again, trying to get into people's minds that this is somehow what environmentalists or the Green Party is talking about? when nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, what we're talking about is a policy, um, in particular, an exit scheme for dairy farmers, if they want it, completely voluntary, to put money in their pockets if they want to reduce their herd over time, over time, so that they're not restocking to the same level. Um, so everything is about financially rewarding people. But it isn't, it's quite right, it isn't just about farming, which is why I didn't kind of, you know, um, dwell on, on agriculture at the start, actually um, pesticides and uh, you know the sustainable use of pesticides um, directive and uh, hopefully coming into a regulation, that is just as much about pesticides in, in other things, not just agriculture. So it's stopping use of pesticides around playgrounds, around uh, outdoor sporting facilities, uh, and it specifically mentions all of those kind of, you know, what's, what's called... Um, as with sensitive areas. But I, I, I did just want to say one thing, and that is that obviously, as a politician, we're always looking for you know, more and more, and particularly when it comes to nature, because we're in such sharp decline, it, it, it's unimaginable. Um, but actually underpinning the new cap are some of, these, uh, some, some of these policies as well. And what you'll see is farmers in Ireland, in their droves, uh, signing up to any environmental scheme that is put in place by CAP or indeed by the government, um, in their droves, oversubscribed every every one of the environmental schemes. Actually, once people realise that uh, they're going to be supported economically and that there will be a, a better, more viable future, people do um, do do take steps necessary. Farmers included, um, and, and we've seen that any of the research will show that just as many people in rural Ireland as in urban Ireland care about the environment. So let's just get the facts out there and stop pulling it into a direction of s somehow that environmentalists are against farming. Nothing could be further from the truth because we absolutely 100% rely on those who are managing and caring for the land and we need to pay them uh, to, to do that work. But we also have to be honest, honest politicians with integrity we cannot keep going the way things are. We just can't. We will have no food security, um, and we're failing future generations. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Pauline. Um, I mean, I think that was a more than complete answer to, to, to my question, and you got in quite a lot of points there. So, so thank you very much for that. But I think that overall, uh, your view is that politicians, in fact, do really care about it because they understand what the future is if people don't care about climate change. Uh, I think that's well. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't know that all politicians do care about it. Uh, you made that no, point, right? uh, yeah. I, 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 think that unfortunately there's a lot of cynical kind of manoeuvring at the moment in politics, and um, and we're just going to have to just keep being honest with people. Okay, thanks so much, J uh, James. I'm going to turn to you next. I mean, this year it's 50 years since Ireland joined uh, what was then known as the as the EEC. Uh, and when Ireland joined the gross domestic product GDP per head of population was about 56% of the EU a average last year it was 220% of the EU average so Ireland as a country has become quite rich but certainly I remember back in, in 1973 uh, what was said was that for the farmers joining the EEC was a really really good thing uh, because 
uh, your background is, is sustainability and I know that we've moved on since 1973 and we've changed our farming styles but if you could turn the clock back what would a sustainable agriculture look like today? So if I could turn the clock back to if we put it in train in 1973 what we would have to what it would have today well I think at the time in 1973 we were at such a low base in terms of the economy you know and we were the society a lot of people at the time had no other option but to, our young people were leaving going to the UK and America you know so we had a really societal problem in terms of the loss of young people abroad as well so in that case as well the environment at the time was taking a downturn because we were having uh, an agricultural revolution in Ireland but at a slower pace because we didn't have the economics to, to drive it at the time but in terms of sustainability we really concentrated on the economy and trying to get young people back it didn't really work uh, right into the 80s we continued on hemorrhaging uh, the younger generation from from the country but the EU really sort of the, the cash injection from from the EU into the country led to more and more development the attraction more not necessarily of the the EU as well was a combination I think of the EU and the foreign direct investments throughout the 80s that led to the creation of a of a lot of jobs through the 90s and 2000s and when I was coming out of college in the 90s people were still immigrating but there was a, a glimpse of an opportunity now we blew that opportunity with the the uh, we ran away with ourselves during the the Celtic tiger and actually shot the tiger you know as much as things do for much the rest of uh, of nature through through greed and inequality and people with their 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 head in the trough really uh, essentially to be honest you know so I think that's one thing the EU gave us great opportunities you know uh, we uh, to a certain extent blew them from an environmental point of view we blew it for a time with the economic we're trying to uh, bring that back again from a societal perspective I think as, as Henry referenced uh, the society we live in today in terms of prosperity you know in terms of it is an unequal society but even it's not as unequal as, a, as, a, as other countries you know so I think we're doing quite well on that but we did really leave the environment behind so I think that's the that's the key thing here is we have to reset that balance and go back to what I said originally the economy is just a tool of a functioning society and both the economy and society has to work within the limits of the environment and we've forgotten that golden rule and that we think as as humans we can manage our way uh, out of this without realizing the limits of the environment so i think more attention to the the limits in the environment understanding what we can do and it's one thing i do honestly believe that we have a, a country with a wonderful environment even with the worst ravages of of climate change we will be in a better position than mo most other parts of the co of, of the world which will put a responsibility on us in terms of food and fiber production as well but also our population will with climate refugees is going to increase more in the next 20 or or, or 30 30 years so we we have to manage this differently than what we've managed things over the last 30 or 40 years in the eu and we have to start taking a more balanced approach to environment first uh, society second and the economy just as a tool to make the rest of it work okay thanks very much for that james henry while i was listening to your presentation one of the things that sort of struck me um a bit painfully in fact was you said that nobody listened to, to farmers um and it's certainly within the european commission when we propose legislation we try and do as much consultation as we possibly can uh, we always do impact assessments uh, on our proposals and in that context we, we engage with, uh, with stakeholder groups. Uh, we also have had a series of citizens dialogues where we speak directly to citizens and I guess something like this, uh, the, this event is sort of you know where we try and, and, and reach and, and speak to people. Uh, we also had the conference on the, on the future of Europe which ended up last, last May where we asked citizens how it is they felt that uh, you know Europe should looked like in the future uh, and what ideas they had for, for shaping Europe but coming back to the point that you made and the, the fact that you're saying that you know Irish farmers in particular uh, are not listened to and I think you were talking really about in the context of the European Union how is it you think that we could better listen to farmers issues uh, in, in, the, in Europe? Yeah thanks Jim so um, I wasn't referring specifically to you I was referring to our own country as well very very clearly uh, I think um, you know Pauline uh, used the word the equivalent of trust. Um, I have a major issue with trust in terms of how farmers are treated. Uh, I think we're pawns in a lot of big games. Uh, I would challenge you a little bit, Tim, in terms of consultation. I believe the entire 
uh, re-wetting process at the moment is being done without consultation. The product has been designed and now we're being told about it and this is what we need to do. I think in the early stages of it, there was a lot of, you know, you can use multiple kind of words, but they, they all amounted, amounted to fear for farmers that private farmland was going to be re-wetted. Uh, it's kind of coming to the point now where they're accepting maybe board pneumonia can do a lot of it. Um, do a percentage of it in, in the short term, certainly the 2030 targets, uh, state owned land. Uh, but the bottom line is, if, if, if farmers uh, were silent, they'd be like lambs because their land would be simply taken off them. So um, I, I appreciate all, all of the consultation that's done. At this stage, agriculture farmers, unfortunately, totally different to the time you asked the question uh, of James on. They make up about 5% of our population. You know, back the time we joined the EU, it was something in the region of 40%. Back in that era, uh, we were a much poorer country. We spent maybe in the region of 35% of our income feeding ourselves. Today, as I said, it's around 10% there thereabouts. So it's a completely changed environment. The role of food producers um, has slipped dramatically in the eyes of the public. The people that purchase maybe organic food or otherwise uh, at market stalls identify with the farmer, but 90 plus percent of the food, produce, of the food consumed uh, is now gone through the major retailers and through huge promotional advertising and marketing uh, regimes, the relationship uh, consumers have now is actually with the retailers uh, rather than with the primary producer, and we're the victims of that. And in, in our situation with our population base relative to the food we produce, particularly you know, on a couple of the commodities like dairy, dairy beef, uh, sheep, and so on like that, uh, if we didn't have exports, we'd be a disaster because our retailers uh, or processors will not pay as a fair price for their produce unless the international markets rise because you know the big price increase that came in milk last year which unfortunately has collapsed completely now that we're getting less uh, than we got two years ago for our milk uh, that came about because of world markets and it's not anything that we can thank any of our Irish processors for uh, it, was, it was world market demand that lifted all boats as we refer to it in Ireland at the time Okay, perfect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw the floor open to for questions here for people in the audience. And I'd like to remind people at home that they can submit their questions using Slido and the Slido code once again is 2379094. But let's start here in the in the audience that we have here in Galway this evening. Uh, so those, is there anybody first that wants to ask a question? If not, I'll go to the Slido questions. Yeah, we've got a gentleman here in a check short. If you wouldn't mind explaining who you are when you ask your question, sir. My name is Brendan Smith uh, from the Galway National Park State Initiative and involved a lot of environmental projects in Galway. And I just have to say, every single speaker made really, really good points. You know, And the whole thing about demonization with the Green Party on one side and, and the farmers on the other, with rural on one side and the urban on the other, with the rural TDs on one side and the EU on the other is so, so wrong. Like I live in Galway City, I consider myself a farmer, a part-time farmer, because I grow my own food and I, uh, I have my own orchard. And so many of us are in the city. So how do you define the farmer now? Because uh, so many farmers, as you say, um, Henry, are part-time. But James, you were uh, wrong on one big point. Uh, you talked about the change in this, uh, when we joined the European Union, that it was the environment that suffered. Farming suffered. We went from 40% to 5%. But the question I ask is you, Henry, how come the F IFA haven't saw the future? How come they don't promote vegetable farming in Ireland? How come they don't promote, promote fruit uh, um, uh, farming in Ireland? How do come they don't promote organic farming in Ireland? There are three gains. And you can look around. To me, what the IFA in this present form, and what you spoke was brilliant, it's supporting an Ireland that is dying. As you said, fi so many farmers are, are over 59. You go to any town or village in Ireland, it's full of empty shops. Once upon a time, they were market towns. I grew up in that Ireland. And I just feel that the IFA are so heavily concentrated on livestock when the solution is outside livestock. And I just can't understand why the IFA cannot see that. So the question is to you. Uh, the first point I would make, um, and, and I actually referenced most of it within the few words I had at the start, for the most part there's no avenue to market. The retailers control everything at the moment. Our horticulture, our vegetable, whichever word you want to put on it, industry has been choked. If you cannot supply central distribution to Dunn Stores, Tesco, Tesco, Aldi, any of the big multiples, they're all the same. They are not willing to entertain you knocking on the door at the shop 
and bringing in your bag of lovely fresh veg or, or apples from the orchard like you have. They want centralised distribution above and leak slip where there's some major supplier that they can count on 365 days a year. Local food is not about that. At this stage in time, I also referenced the diverse diet we have. You know, the days of cabbage and bacon and spuds and carrots being the main menu in Ireland are long gone. You know, they want the avocado, they want the rice, they want the coffee beans. You know, if you listen to any conversation, they're not talking about the spuds, they're not talking about the cabbage. They're talking about these kind of exotic products in their diet. And that's where we have uh, started to consume everything, as I referenced earlier, air mileage, mileage, all of it. So I think the big issue we have here is all of these industries, one by one, became uneconomic. The really unfortunate part about it in latter years is that they, as they became unviable, unfair trading practices, lack of access to market has denied anybody the opportunity to establish businesses to get back in other than niche markets. You know, if you live kind of on the outskirts of a major centre of population and you were brave enough to open your little shop and you have your coffee machine beside it, you'd probably try, especially if you're a person that can engage with the people that come in the door because a lot of people uh, in those environments like a little bit of chit chat and you know a bit of an engage, whereas you don't always get that in the big retailer, you get tap, tap, tap. So you have certain categories, an unfair word, a certain type of people that enjoys that. But the, the 10% of the, the, the best product we produce in this country is milk. We're the best in Europe, nearly the best in the world at producing it. It's recognised internationally. We cannot supply enough milk to a lot of foreign countries. You know, if I, if I was to ask anybody here, like a lot of people have problems that we produce milk and that we export it. If I was to ask anybody here, in terms of every part of their body, their phone, their shoes, their shirt, you know, any parts that they're wearing, where does it come from? And I, if I said to you, you can only buy Irish, there'd be a lot of people go out of here and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be wearing much. So we have an international trade that has become the accepted norm. The whole thing got disrupted initially by the, the Suez Canal blockage. It's getting disrupted now because of rivers, climate issues, rivers running dry in China, which has been supplying all of our product. So we had a very, very lean globe until about 2019. And now all of that has been disrupted most recently by that you know, horrendous action uh, by Putin. But I think that's the real problem we have. The first start I'll put on it is, and it was very, very well referenced here, why not put a population of 20 million in this country? Who's to say there will not be a population of 20 million in this country in five or ten years' time? We're talking about minority groups coming in as being people being displaced. When you think about our environment relative to the areas of the world that are ravaged with climate issues, this country is going to be overflowing a bit like Long Island in New York, probably in 20 or 50 years' time. We'll have 5, 10, 15, 20 million people living here, and then we'll be able to do well to supply our own food locally. But at the moment, the retailers have us in a stranglehold. We cannot get a fair price for our produce because there's limited market access. And grain being another example there. You know, grain is just shocking the price they're paid for their grain because the big mills don't want it. Diageo, apologies Tim, Diageo approached the grain producers about three years ago to put their shoulder behind a marketing campaign uh, to promote alcohol. The grain that's in alcohol, we get one cent out of every pint that's consumed by society or by whoever drinks a pint, I'm not promoting alcohol. But the pint I'm making is grain is the raw material, one cent, and they had cheek to approach the IFA and farmers to ask them whether to put their shoulder the wheel and we'll give you a price rise we'll double your income you get two cents out of the pint okay thanks thanks very much for, for that henry i'm i'm going to take uh, a question from slide or no which has come in from the online audience and then we move back to the the physical audience again and i think this really is a question for senator o'reilly uh and the question is whether or not and it follows sort of directly from what henry said uh can irish consumers make a difference by supporting irish agricultural produce or is this only a minor effort against carbon emissions by the bigger companies? Obviously, everything that we do can, can have a real impact. Um, and so, you know, that, that is a, a buying local so that there, there aren't air miles, obviously. Um, but we're not going to we're not going to probably see a situation where we are only using Irish pro products. But I mean, I would agree with a lot of what Henry has said. 
about local producers, about markets, um, and we need to see a return to that. But it, do, it, it does mean that consumers need to get on board and need to understand, as James said, the real sense of urgency here. It's urgent for the environment, but it's also urgent for the future of farming that we get this right. And you know, a lot of the problems that Henry is referencing are the very reason that the IFA should be signing up to try and do things differently. Um, and it's not just the IFA, you know, uh, and there are a lot of great people, obviously, in, in the IFA um, who are trying to, to, to make the changes and talk about what, what can be different. Um, but lobby groups, let's make no mistake, lobby groups on agriculture, agribusiness in particular, they're the, pretty much the strongest lobby group in Europe. Uh, they are the ones who talk to all of the politicians. They pretty much have a, a cafe named after them in the European Parliament because they're there so much. But I don't believe that they are truly supporting farmers that I know, particularly in the west of Ireland, who are you know, small farmers, family farmers, um, living in you know, rich biodiverse um, land oftentimes. Um, and they're really what they're doing is supporting big business. And we need to call that out. You know, because everything that's in farm to fork should be there, actually is there to support a different type of farming that's a better type of farming that is based on a better type of consumption for us all because everything goes hand in hand. The consumption, the farming, the environment, they all have to go hand in hand. So there's no good reason to lobby against these kind of practices because you're really lobbying against the future for farming. Okay, thanks Pauline. I turn to the physical audience here this evening in Galway Library. Is there anybody else who wants to ask a question from the from the audience? If not, sorry, there's a lady here in the front row. Uh, microphone is there. An observation as much as anything. Um, you mentioned the 5 million here and that we're feeding 65 million. Is that what you'd said earlier? Yeah. But what are we supplying? I know, yeah to those areas yeah yeah i know yeah. so but the food that we're supplying while it is absolutely of the top quality beef and and the milk there's no doubt but you know are we just uh, my background i'm sorry i didn't introduce myself councillor martino o'connor of green party and with the background in nursing and my background in nursing always makes me wonder about is it such a good idea to export those products to countries that really wouldn't have a high amount of them in their diet are we just exporting our you know to some extent our biggest killer which is heart disease you know is that <laughs> and it's very sad that you know i think the farmers have been sold a terrible pup to be you know that to i saw great celebrations at one point you know a few years ago there where there was a huge contract for exporting um formula milk of course there's a demand for it but I think there was a very heavy kind of a promotion to export it. And, you know, I would never, I, ca I can't see how we could possibly celebrate exporting formula milk. That is unconscionable completely to me. But, you know, again, is it, I think the far farmers have been sold a puff on that some of these are a good idea of what they're producing. And, and completely agree with Liam that what he is saying there that they're dependent now on it. And how do we fix that dependency piece is, is really where I would love to see the direction of this to go. Okay, the, the question was sort of directed at, at James. James, I don't know if you want to take some or, or all of that question. I mean, yeah, certainly it, it's a complex issue yeah. uh, because as you say, you know, we, we are exporting the way we eat, the way we do, do business uh, on other people around the world and indeed you know when people look into Ireland they look at cancer and things like that and compare diets with Eastern diets and Mediterranean diets and say we could do things differently so do you, do you want to take yeah, up just uh, on, on the diet issue we can export food to other parts of the world and you know we're importing food from other parts of the world as well but in terms of exporting our consumption patterns I would never advocate that we have the situation in terms of the, the food agriculture organization would regularly monitor this as well as the United Nations we have almost a billion people go malnourished in, in the world in terms of the undersupplied with adequate calories and nutrition and essentially uh, 600,000 to 800,000 depending on what metrics you take in terms of uh, in uh, serious malnutrition at risk of starvation and going to bed uh, with that hanging over them every night. 
On the other end of the spectrum, we have almost as many, if not more, people with obesity issues, health-related overconsumption of the wrong types of food issue, you know. And a lot of that is overconsumption of particular food groups. Uh, and so I, I honestly believe, in terms of what I mentioned there, in terms of the Food Agriculture Organization's definition of a sustainable diet, you know, that doesn't, it means predominantly plant-based, but it doesn't mean all plant-based. We need nutrient-dense food within that as well. We produce the nutrient-dense food very, very well within an Irish context. I think where we're losing out here, we should be promoting, essentially, uh, balanced diets across the, the globe, which in, this essential, in the developed part of the world is less meat and dairy consumption and over consumption of that, but maybe more of that consumption where you've got malnutrition in, in other parts of the world and a more equitable sharing of resources. In terms of the 65 million people that we can be supplying a part of their diet of this nutrient dense food, I think that is something that we should be doing, but while doing that, we should also be promoting sustainable uh, diets uh, among that. And in terms of the, uh, the milk powder, it shouldn't be replacing uh, breast milk, but it can be used in terms of uh, malnutrition situations, support in famine situations where it's a nutrient dense food to bring people back up and in, in them sort of situations. So, and I think in that context, we're marketing our food wrong in that context. We should be marketing it on the basis of reduce, eat across the globe, eat less of it. But when you are eating less of it and eating a balanced diet, you should choose the areas of the world where it can be produced in a manner that has least impact. And we shouldn't, just because we say we can produce more, but we shouldn't be sacrificing our environmental quality here at home for just bigger and bigger export markets. And who's profiting from that? It's not the farmers, it will be the, the retailers and the, and the angry business. Now, nothing against, we need retailers, we need angry business as well, but the proportion of profits that are going to them, we need a, a more of a global conversation around this. And I think the, the debate around uh, meat bad, dairy bad, plant good is not right and as you know as a nurse you know it is a nutritionally balanced diet that really Ireland can play an important role in given our land base and given the what Henry referenced to in terms of uh, of climate change and the reduced amount of land we're going to have for producing the food uh, across the globe. Okay thanks thanks very much for that James. Uh, just some further comments coming in here on Sido and a uh, comment from Councillor Michael Connolly. I don't know what party Councillor Connolly is with but I suspect he's with Fianna Fáil. Uh, and he says that he agrees with your analysis, Henry, on global warming. He says that he's a rural public rep, and he claims that he's not stoked up for your appalling. So, uh, anyway, I, I'm not making any personal comments against Councillor Connolly at all, but there, I think we do know that there is a lot of stoking up fear. And just because people keep saying to you over and over again, the Green Party hate farmers, does not mean it's true. Ask yourself some questions. Why are they doing it? They're doing it for their benefit, not yours. Um, but I mean, I, I know Councillor Connolly and he's, he's a very fine politician, so it's certainly nothing personal. Okay, um, we, we'll take one or two more questions from the audience. Uh, a gentleman at the back uh, with a great t-shirt, if you could tell us where you're from, sir, please. Um, Stephen Canavan, uh, Curfin, I'm a farmer in Curfin. Um, and I, I know two of the panelists here anyways. Um, look at, um, Farmers in Galway and indeed the west of Ireland, you know, you know, th there's an awful lot of, of space for nature and that in, in, in our farms. I think 93% of the farms this year are farmers uh, qualify under the space for nature aspect of the new basic payment scheme. And that is, you have to at least 10% of your land base that is, uh, that is hedgerows or water features or, or scrubland or bog or whatever like but at least 10 percent so we're, we're well on the way and the question i suppose is how much more do you want us to do and and in light of that we're told every day what we can and do and what we're doing wrong not so many people are so clever and tell us what we should do or what we can do and bearing in mind first and foremost uh, my income to support my family is of paramount importance and and where the environment is awful important it's secondary. Um, and and Councillor Rennie, you pointed out there about, uh, uh, you know, subsidies and things like that. We've, we've experienced over the last 10 or 15 years reduction in subsidies. And, and, and uh, further to that, if we have a reduction in, in, in productivity, invariably it's going to be a reduction in income. So uh, government has failed to address it. Uh, the EU has failed to address it. Um, 
And I suppose the other question is, um, if there is a reduction in cattle numbers, be meat, beef, sheep, whatever it is, the rest of the world are only too quick to pick up the void that's left. In Brazil last year, they felled uh, an area the size of County Mayo of the rainforest. So no matter what we plant over here, we're not going to be able to do that. And if we did, all of Ireland would be full of trees in 20 years. That's the, the multiplication of it. There has to be space for farmers as well as space for nature. Look, uh, thanks very much for, for those very valid points, in fact. I mean, you know, what you're doing is you're comparing Ireland with Ireland, whereas in the European Commission, we're comparing, comparing other countries with, with the European average. And I think I need to point out that, you know, when the Common Agriculture Policy, when Ireland first joined the, the NEC in 1973, the, it was the Common Agriculture Policy that was the mainstay of, of farmers' income for, for quite a long time. But over, over the years, the Common Agriculture Policy has, has sort of changed its direction. And now we're looking at about 40% of the Common Agriculture Policy being directed towards biodiversity. And I mean, we spoke earlier about the, the re-wetting, which is one aspect of what we call the nature uh, restoration law. But I mean, the objective of that is to bring back biodiversity. It's to bring back things like the corn crate that has almost totally disappeared. Uh, animals and birds, um, some uh, aquatic animals also have disappeared or almost disappeared uh, from the countryside. And this is an effort to bring it back. I mean, we, we tried it with, uh, with blanket bogs, for example, to keep the, uh, the environment the way it was. And we have to start somewhere to ensure that Europe becomes climate neutral by, by, by 2050. And, you know, the, the thing is that you're absolutely right because the farmers occupy most of the land, so they seem, they seem to be the target. But we like to think that we're working hand in love with the farmers uh, and that where there are improvements to be made, that the farmers are our partners to ensure that we achieve our objectives. Uh, but so, I mean, I, I accept everything that you say, that for you, the most important thing is to ensure that you can put food on the table for your kids. That's, that's hugely important. Uh, but, you know, I think it's been said here already this evening, the farmers are custodians of the land for the future generations. And we must, we must think of that. And what we're trying to do in the European Union is we're trying to ensure uh, that Europe is to the forefront uh, in the, uh, bio uh, the challenge that we're facing to bring back bio biodiversity. But thank you very much for, for your comments. Other questions or comments here? A lady here in a, uh, in a green top. If you could tell us where you're from, please. Hello, um, my name is Claire. Um, lovely. And I am um, from a new social enterprise based here in Galway um, that we're just setting up called Hinterland that is going to look at food systems. Um, I just would like to ask in the context of, um, I know James brought it up and I would agree that I, I do feel that the solution here will come from the middle out, um, from the lo from locals, um, and hopefully it won't be such a knee-jerk um, reaction. Um, and I'm also I'm interested to to um, get your view, Henry. Um, just in the context that everything that we've spoken about, um, from a local perspective, and you know you've spoken about a few things, communication consultation, the supermarkets, the what would be, you know, the key one or two things or solutions that you would feel that could make a difference for you as a farmer? Okay, Henry, you're a teacher for a day. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your answer. Uh, I, I think as a... Um, Thank you very much. I, I would still put income viability at the core. We're seeing an exodus from agriculture and we're seeing an aging profile because the income is not in it. The youth are not interested in joining the farms because they can earn a lot more income off farm. So agriculture farming as a career or a profession is not as attractive. It certainly can't offer the bright lights that a lot of people like to go to the cities for a number of years. Uh, the age profile in agriculture partially is caused because the 59 year old person is not in a position to hand over the farm to the 29 year old person and survive for the next seven years with a dual income. So income is a challenge. I, th I think within that, uh, the price we receive for our produce is grossly unfair. I, I think um, 
when I quote the figure, uh, society pay around 10%, Irish people pay around 10% of their income for food. That's at the retailer. That's not at the farm gate. So in general, we're doing very, very well to get 30% of that price across the range of everything. You know, the best example I can give, and the man has left us there now, you know, the 49 cent bag of carrots. I mean, like for God's sake, I'd say the plastic nearly cost 49 cent to put around it. How they can provide people with vegetables at 49 cents, and then that somebody can inquire, why don't we grow the vegetables for them? You know, that means that farmer's probably getting 15 or 20 cent for that 49 cent bag. So we have challenges there in terms of unfair trading practices and retail power. So uh, beyond that then, uh, I, I would say one of the things is uh, appreciation. I think every one of us like to kind of feel a bit of dignity that what we're doing in life, what we're doing you know, in our everyday careers that we can feel good about it. You know, we don't want to be kind of you know, working on Wall Street, making a fortune and you know, going out in the Georgia Armani suit and you know, beating the chest. The ordinary person likes to have a bit of uh, respect and appreciation. Uh, and I would suggest in Irish society, I can't talk about European society, I would say in Irish society today, farmers are not uh, appreciated or valued or acknowledged or thanked for anything. I think Stephen made the point very, very well. A lot of people are very good at telling us what we're doing wrong. There's nobody ever takes the time to tell us what we're doing right. Okay, hopefully we'll, we'll change that in, in due course, uh, or maybe sooner rather than later, in fact, uh, because, you know, the farmers are doing a, a very, very good job in producing clean, safe food, and that's what the EU food policy is about. Uh, you know, farm to fork, everything's traceable, we know where stuff has come from, and farmers get, should get a decent price uh, for, their, for their product. Do you mind, Tim, if I interrupt on just one point? Apologies. The communication, I think, is crucial as well at yeah. the end of it in that you know, if the right thing for farmers to do is to plant 10 trees, just to pick a figure, if the right thing is to plant a hedgerow, you know, the EU policy that finished, the, the um, CAP policy that finished last December, penalised me if I had a wet spot on my farm that animals couldn't graze. It penalised me if my white thorn hedge grew too wide and created a shadow on the ground. They said that that was not suitable for agricultural purposes. All of that flicked overnight yep. on the 1st of January. So I think there's areas like that that I've been, my arm has been twisted by policy to take certain actions that I was never comfortable with, yep. you know, clearing things. And suddenly today now, that's acceptable and we're being punished for not having it. Yeah, I mean, but th th that shows, you know, that we, we listen to people and that we change the policy when it's absolutely necessary. But I see that James is bursting together. Yeah, here. Good. Just on that eligibility rules, we've been pushing at EU level for that to be changed for yep. 2013. It would it could have been changed in 2015. The subsidiarity was there for Ireland to change eligibility rules and we didn't have our own department of agriculture level. There was a resistance to that. For, for ages, you know. So that is one thing. In terms of uh, one initiative that I'm involved in is the Farming for Nature initiative that celebrates the good work that farmers are doing for nature across the country. We, uh, in that initiative, uh, highlight the work of 20 ambassadors uh, each year. We're meeting actually on, on Saturday in one of the Farming for Nature ambassadors to see how more we can promote this. So we actually do promote through that initiative with, with Brendan Dunford the good work that farmers are doing and actually have an awful lot of information produced through the Farming for Nature initiative where we have peer to peer, it's not telling farmers what to do, the farmers work together showcasing what they have, have done and across all sectors, across the dairy sector, the arable sector, the beef, uh, extensive high nature value farming systems as well as relatively intensive systems as well uh, across the country. So there are a lot of these initiatives out there that demonstrate the power that of what farmers have done at an individual farm level, but also groups of farmers in local areas. So we, they are not getting the same traction, because that's a good news story, and it's often the bad news story and the polarization that's picked up on the media, but that Farm for Nature initiative is a different level of trying to appreciate farmers, and we always work on that. We have a motto we try to work on, the head, the heart, uh, and the pocket. It has to make sense from the head and business sense from the point of view of farmer. From the heart, farmers have to be respected uh, they're standing elevated in society to that of a solicitor or a doctor. We can do without a doctor until we're sick. We cannot do without a doctor for breakfast, dinner, or, or, or tea, you know? So and that is not acknowledged within society. 
but also farmers today we're expecting them to do an awful lot more in terms of being uh, land managers uh, our saviors in terms of climate uh, space for nature stuff. but i believe we can do all that but we if farmers can't do it alone we have to support it and work together to do it and i believe when we get to the crisis and most of society wake up to the crisis we're in it will be going back to working together the alternative is un unimaginable and unthinkable in terms of societal breakdown but we will pull it back okay we're coming close to the end now but uh, i want to do two things first i want to take one further question which has come in uh on um uh, from the online audience and then i want to give everybody two minutes just to summarize uh you know or to give ideas that they haven't been able uh to give out during during the session but the first thing I want to do is I just want to come to this question which has come in on, on our Slido. And it's a little bit political, so I think I'm going to address it to Senator Riley. Uh, and this questioner says, is the mass emigration of young people in Ireland, whether one agrees with whether or not this is this person's view, caused by the lack of housing and the cost of living, is that having an effect on maintaining farms in Ireland? So the questioner is asking, is there an impact between the position that young people see themselves in having to emigrate the country and the maintaining of, of farms in Ireland. If you could answer that in just like one, one minute and then I'll okay. do the two minute yeah, round. I, I mean, I, I, do think, I do think that it is having an impact. We have record employment in Ireland um, and it means therefore that it's kind of an employee's market. And I mean, I'm contacted by people right across the spectrum. So it's not just farming, it's, it's in other areas as well, in retail. Where people are ha having finding it really difficult to get people to do the work um, and to do that kind of manual work it is probably more difficult yeah. than it ever was and um, but i will say that you know um, when i've spoken to macro and firma about this with the young farmers and um, they've come into the climate action committee which i'm a member of in the Oireachtas, and um, they have looked for they were looking for three things when they came t to us one of those was for ecologists to help support them in new practices, which I think is a, a really good and positive thing and shows that I think young people in farming in particular see a different future than older generations. Um, and the second really crucial one was around mental health supports. Okay. Um, so I do think judgment and criticism, even though you know, it's certainly not coming from us, but there probably is over overall in society this, um, you know, a, a a reduced appreciation for where our food comes from and that really really needs to change in order to bring farming up to the level that it should be at okay we're coming to the end of our session and for me the time has absolutely flown because it was so interesting interesting subjects uh, discussed so now i'm going to give each of the panelists just two minutes either to make a final point or to say something that they wish they had said but maybe somebody else said it for them in the meantime and i'm going to do it in this order i'm going to start with james and i'm going to go to henry and finally i'm going to finish with with pauline so james your two minutes starting now so I suppose maybe a message of, of hope uh, at the end. We can feel uh, an awful lot of despair with the state of the challenges we're, we're, we're facing and obviously the, the pressure that farmers are under is, is evident in the room today as well. But one thing in terms of the combating biodiversity loss, one initiative that I was involved in this year that gave me great hope was uh, the Citizens Assembly on, on Biodiversity Loss. I had the pleasure of working as uh, an advisor to the, the Citizens Assembly on the agriculture and, and land use side. And I think the work that then 99 citizens and the chair, Avon Sullivan, have done in terms of producing this framework is absolutely fantastic. And it's not just around what we do in, in rural areas, it's urban, it's in business, it's taken a, a sectoral approach, everything from how we energy, how we consume, what we produce, how we use our land, our interactions with our waters, our interactions uh, with our sea. I think if government are, are serious about combating the biodiversity uh, uh, loss in this in this country, this can be the framework for our new contract with with nature going forward over the next thirty to, to to fifty years. And I think we should work our way through the recommendations on this on a sector by sector basis. It's a very high level recommendations, but we can work this out and how this can be applied. As I said before, on our farm by farm, parish by parish, town by, by town, city, city by city. And if we can get it right in all our individual local areas, all them pieces of the jigsaw fitting together fixes the problem. The problems at national and, and global level seem insurmountable. But if we can break them down to working in our own local communities, like the GA does for centuries, like Irish people have always worked in our own individual tribes, 
the tribe is, is, is very strong, the parish is, is very strong. We can actually make this happen, but it will take a lot of trust that is broken at the moment that needs to be uh, uh, rebuilt. It will need us actually stepping back from the controversy that's now that's been led by the politicians. One thing I know, I, I would think whether I'd say this or not at the start, but maybe it's a good soundbite for anyone in the media listening, you know. We have not wolves in Ireland at the moment, but I've seen an awful lot of howling at the moon by a lot of politicians around the issues <coughs> around the in environment at, at the moment, okay? So, that, so they're one section of nature, that howling at the moon I would like to see got rid of in the, in the morning, you know? So we need to step back from the brink, have a rational, even handed discussion about this. No one has all the answers, but collectively, I honestly believe that we can come up with the solutions for a better way forward for us all. Okay, thanks James, and thanks very much for your positivity. I think that's a very positive way to end this discussion. Henry, yeah. two minutes. Thanks Tim. I, I, I would equally like to finish on a positive point. I think the awareness that has developed in all of our communities around nature is extremely positive. I, th I think within agriculture, farmers are natural custodians of the countryside to start with, but they're natural custodians of nature as well. One of the great examples I suppose I'd give at the moment uh, is the absolute role reversal of the nettle. The nettle, when I was growing up, was one of the most hated plants. Invariably, if the football went in it in your short trousers or whatever else, you'd never go near a nettle again. We now understand the role a nettle has in terms of biodiversity around butterflies, around so much insect life. So all of that, to me, comes back again to education and knowledge communicated in a proper and fair manner. I'm not going to touch on the income aspect of it again, I've that uh, well referenced, but I think within all of it, within agriculture, there is a breakdown in communication between policymakers and the farmers on the ground. Our own government implement policies without communication. I appreciate the point you've made, Tim, as regards all of the consultation within the EU, but I would also suggest there are a significant number of policies come from the EU that have not been adequately understood in advance and they're feisted upon us and then you have the defence up right away then how am I going to deal with this and within all of it then you have a little bit of miscommunication a little bit of manipulation of the facts the media get their hands on it they make a couple of juicy stories out of it and they create a lot of panic around the whole thing and if it was communicated properly in the first place combined with income combined with respect in society I think we'll all achieve an awful lot together yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, maybe should be doing this, but just to, to address your question about the communication. The difficulty is that the way the European Union works is, is quite complicated because we, our organisation, where I come from, the European Commission, is the only body that can make legislative proposals within the European Union. And we're totally independent of governments and, and member states. And all of the commissioners, uh, our current Irish commissioner is, is Mary McGuinness, who just happens to be an Irish person. She's not the commissioner for Ireland, if you see what I mean. So the Commission as a college make proposals in areas where we feel a, a proposal is necessary to be made, such as you know the, the, the Green Deal. Then, then it moves into the political sphere. Then it's discussed by the Council, by the Ministers and by the European Parliament. And we spoke earlier about the re-wetting thing and there's a lot has happened on, on, on nature restoration in the European Parliament this week and, and, and last week. But you know, I think everybody understands that this is real politics at work because the European Parliament is a democratic elected institution so therefore they represent the people so people in the European Parliament have to take the views of the of the people into heart but sorry I, I, don't, I don't want to go on but I'm just saying that the, uh, when I was listening to all of this over the past few days uh, I said to myself the most of the problem here is that people do not understand the role of the European Parliament and don't understand the role of the political groups within the European Parliament uh, and don't understand how legislation is made which is Commission proposals and then the council i.e the member states and the parliament come together and agree on it uh, and then at the end of the day if there's no agreement the commission steps in and acts as an honest broker and we have what we call a trial out to ensure that every, everything uh, comes within uh, everything is agreed but anyway sorry that, that's an aside sorry Pauline I've eaten into your time I've said I'd give me two minutes off you go <coughs> that's fine um, yeah I suppose just to, to say and to Stephen's point earlier who's in the audience um, you know there is a lot happening in Ireland um, and the steps that we need are, are a little bit of everything 
and in some areas Ireland is going to find that it's quite easy to, to meet targets and in other areas it's going to be more difficult. That's, that's the, the same for every particular country. Um, but we have actually in Ireland, our bogs, our peatland has the same potential for storing carbon as the whole of the Amazon. Like we actually have nature at our fingertips here in Ireland that we have a, we have a duty to protect as well for future generations but for people all over the, the, the globe, in fact. Um, I just wanted to make the final point that uh, I did reference earlier on, that when we do put in place schemes, every scheme, we, there's always consultation, there's always public consultation, but when we do put in schemes, they're always oversubscribed by farmers. And just last week, we had uh, 2.4 million paid out to farmers um, who were involved in the LIFE project. Um, acre scheme, 45,000 farmers signed up even though it was supposed to be only 30,000. Organics, when we went into government, it was only 2% organics in Ireland, and I would expect that will hit 35 to 4% this year because uh, farmers are signing up in, in their droves, where the target is 10% for Ireland by 2030. And if we continue on this path, we'll hit it. So there's a huge amount of good work being done, and we need diversity. We need, need every type of farming. We just need to make sure that uh, we're protecting nature at the same time. And it's not taking land away from anybody. It's protecting the land that's under current ownership and also the protection of our state land. But we, we have a duty to do this now. Um, and as I say, farmers are the custodians of the land. It absolutely has to be with farmers, but it also has to be done. Thank you very much, Pauline. Listen, I want to thank you. I want to thank Henry. I want to thank James for this high quality discussion that, that we had here this evening. I see we've gotten quite a bit over time and I think you know if we'd added another hour onto the session we would have filled the hour with, with this discussion. Uh, for me it's been fascinating. I hope that it's been enjoyable for you the panel members. I hope that you sitting here in the audience uh, and those of you watching uh, online enjoyed it just as much as, as we do. I just want to mention, uh, I want to thank our hosts uh, Galway City Library for, for hosting us uh, here this evening. I want to thank my, my colleague Katia for organising everything and uh, our contractors for the night, uh, we the people who have done an excellent job, thank, thank you so much guys. And also uh, our colleague from the Your Direct Centre, Baldus Lowe, who came and left some information and some goodies here uh, for, the, for the audience, so thank you very much for, for coming along tonight uh, and joining with us. So, so thank you everybody and uh, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did and uh, I wish you a safe home, bye bye. <laughs>